Good? Yeah. All right. And I'm the last person between you and lunch, so we'll try to get through this relatively quickly. So I'm, go I'm, I'm Lak Lakshmanan. I'm going to be talking about uh, not Gen AI, but architecting data and machine learning platforms. So in some sense, I feel like the, 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 talk, the speaker who was here talking about Android and it's like, how many people actually do Android? So a uh, quick question here, uh, <laughs> Inching does of course. Uh, quick question here, uh, how many of you are uh, developers who work on data, right, in some ways? Data engineers, data analysts, data, okay, so quite a few of you. And the basic thing that I want to get out, to get, want you all to get out of this is that when you're developing any kind of data-based applications, it is really important to make sure that your foundational architecture is there, and that foundational architecture is what we're calling a data and machine learning platform. So everything that I'm going to be talking about is actually excerpts from our new book. It's called Architecting Data and ML Platforms. So buy the book and give it to, your, to the folks on your, system, on your engineering team who are actually out there building your data platform for you and say, these are the things that I want on the uh, data applications that I'm building. So in the book, we basically go through and talk about what a data warehouse is, what a data lake is, a lake house, how you set it up, how you basically migrate from you know, like an older like Hadoop kind of system into, into a more modern cloud-based system, how to basically build enterprise AI applications, how to basically make them reliable, how to set up ML ops, the whole shebang, right? So it's, it's for engineering teams, architecting teams that want to build a data and ML platform to make things a lot more robust. But first of all, right, why? Why do you need a data and ML platform in the first place? Well, you need it because Typically, any application that you build, you're gonna be collecting data from a wide variety of sources. Operational databases, you have an Oracle database, MySQL database, Postgres, you have clickstream data, right? Google Analytics, you have, maybe you have sensors out there sending out data from IoT devices. You have SaaS applications, you're, you're pulling data in from Workday, you're pulling data in from Salesforce. All of this data is important because you're basically allowing people to make decisions to train machine learning models off of the data that you're collecting from this wide variety of systems. But the problem is that all of these systems are typically maintained by different parts of the organization. Right? You have Workday that's maintained by HR, but you basically need to know certain, certain pieces of data that an employee may have set up in Workday. Or if you're setting up a sales application, all of the account tracking is in Salesforce, but you need to know if the person has actually bought the item or not. That outcome information is in some transactional system somewhere and you need to tie these things together. And that is really hard because each of these things are basically silos and you need to be able to break them down. And while you're collecting data from all of these places, anybody who's worked with data in Salesforce knows that it's gonna be really dirty, it's gonna be all kinds of really messy things in there. There's a lot of governance things that you need to care about. At the same time, you want to basically allow, you have, we talk about data analysts, we talk about data engineers, we talk about data scientists. They all need to analyze the data, enrich the data. They, you want to be able to predict user churn. You want to be able to act on the data before they abandon the shopping cart. All of these things are things that you want to do with your data. The problem is, that you don't want to do all of these things each and every time for each and every application. You want to reduce that effort, and the way you do that is by setting up a data and ML platform. So the reason to do a data and ML platform is to avoid repeating the work, and that's with and all engineering. Engineering is about basically reuse, and a data and ML platform allows you to reuse all of those things that we talked about, breaking down silos, being able to do analytics better, et cetera. But, so, how could you do that? And this is something that, we, that I've seen over and over again. I go to an, to an organization and say, okay, how are you building your data applications? And I see these anti-patterns. So these things are not a data and ML platform. The first thing is, right, you say, well, every one of my applications, well, it has a part of the application that's ingesting data, 
you have another module that's storing the data on S3 somewhere, or on Google Cloud Storage in BigQuery somewhere. Now I have my processing application, I have a processing backend, I have my analytics set up in Looker or in Tableau or wherever, and then I have my activation where I'm basically doing a reverse ETL and loading it into Workday or loading it into Salesforce. And people say, I have a data platform because I can do all of these things. Well, just being able to do all of these things doesn't mean that you're reducing your effort because what you're doing things are, you're doing them in a very one-off way. You don't have your reuse. The second thing that you have to think about is like, if you do things as a one-off, you have an application, you're doing it, lots of times you're not taking into account the very common engineering aspects of basically doing all of this data handling. How much data can you basically process? What is the speed at which you can process? What is the latency? Are you able to do structured data and unstructured data? So one way to think about it is, if you're building a platform, you think about specialization, right? In your organization, you have people who are primarily building backend systems. You have people who are primarily doing analytics and automation of analytics. And you have people who are building applications that are consuming the insights and consuming the machine learning models that have been built by these teams. And all three of these teams, the way they communicate is across different parts of this process. And the way that they do that is with a data and ML platform. And in order to basically support that specialization and to be able to support these horizontals, such as I want 99.999% availability, right? That's called a horizontal or a security, you want to basically ensure that people are logged in with the right role before they can view the right kind of data. How do you handle PII? That's called a horizontal. And the third thing, right, that a one-off doesn't handle for you is a future use case, right? You, it's, you, you're able to do the things that you do today, but, you, but are you able to do the things that are going to come up a year from now? So that's the second anti-pattern is that you basically build something that doesn't solve the needs of all these roles, or it doesn't meet all of these horizontals, or it doesn't basically handle your future use cases. The third anti-pattern that I see a lot is using ETL, and in amazing reliance on ETL. What's ETL? Extract, transform, load, right? This idea that anytime you want the data, you're gonna go build an ETL pipeline, and you're gonna pull this data from your source system, and then you're gonna basically land it in a data warehouse, and you're gonna use it. What's wrong with that? That's what every, all of us do, right? That's basically what a data platform is, isn't it? Well, the problem with this is that normally what happens is you end up building a different ETL pipeline to go to your source system, but then this transformation that you're doing is for a certain application. Right? So you end up building a bunch of different ETL pipelines, each of which loads the data. So rather than having silos by source system, now you have silos by application. Right? So basically what you've done is that you've taken something that was siloed by a technology that's being used to basically being siloed by a different ap applications and different organizations. You haven't really solved this original problem that we talked about of reuse across the organization. Another anti-pattern that we see quite a bit is basically saying, oh God, okay, the re we, we have a whole bunch of silos by organization. Marketing has built their own data warehouse. Marketing is using BigQuery. And finance has built their own data warehouse and they're using Snowflake. And your third organization is using something else. Well, that's, that's an anti-pattern. So now you basically have a central IT department that comes along and says, all right, we're maintaining the data warehouse for the, uh, for the org. We're standardizing everything. We're moving it to BigQuery or into Redshift or wherever. That doesn't solve it because central organization doesn't work. You lose all of the flexibility of your future use cases. So that's one more anti-pattern before I get to the what, what should you be doing, right? One more anti-pattern. Right, you basically have these things called data marts. What's a data mart? Every business basically says, okay, now I have the central data warehouse. It has everything that I want, but it doesn't have the schema that, that I need. All of the data dictionary is wrong. The data model is wrong. 
So I'm going to basically do yet another ETL and basically create my lil data mart that is for my organization that has the right data structure that I need. Right? So you see this anti-pattern quite often where you have a central data warehouse and then you have these data marts. So you think you have solved the problem and the problem crops up one someplace else. Like people often call this shadow IT. Right? And the reason it's there is because the central central stuff doesn't work. So what do we do? Well, you need to basically think about a platform as a transformation strategy, and I'm going to go through these relatively fast because right, I see everyone making pizza. Okay. <laughs> so uh, when your first question that you want to answer is what kind of a data platform do you need? Do you need a data platform that is purely on the cloud? Do you need a data platform that's hybrid? Or do you need a platform, data platform that also needs edge? Because what you're going to build is going to be different depending on these three things. Ideally, you're building everything on the cloud because what cloud gives you is the centralized governance and access management, but still allows you to basically maintain different warehouses for different needs if necessary. It gives you uh, like consistent uh, identity access management. It gives you an easy data sharing. Like for example, if you're using Snowflake Share or using BigQuery's Analytics Hub, it makes it super easy for you to basically share things. Things It allows you to basically deal with different personas, right? You can have be a data scientist using Vertex AI. You can be a data analyst using Looker and BigQuery. You can be a data engineer using Dataflow, and you're all working on the same data in place without having to move the data around. That's hugely important because cloud gives you the separation of compute and storage. You can have this one piece of data that's interacted upon by different roles in different ways. So that's great, but cloud doesn't always solve the problem. There are situations in which you would need right, more than cloud. You would need this hybrid environment, right? And I know you guys can't read it very well, but oftentimes it's because you have legacy investments sometimes because you're choosing the best of breed. Maybe, for example, you've decided that you're going to use a specific technology from a specific cloud vendor, and so you want to build a multi-cloud kind of situation. And then, of course, edge, because you have latency requirements, you have throughput requirements, and having to do a round trip to the cloud each time isn't going to fit your need. So once you decide that, then basically the idea is you move through these phases. You start with all of the things that are essentially siloed, everybody's built their own, and you move to something that is connected. So you connect all of these so that you get your consolidated view of your data. You're able to do descriptive analytics. You're basically able to, so it's that first step of essentially connecting all of them by using the APIs of the underlying systems. And then, right, once you've basically gotten to the point where you've connected all of them, you're now moving the data, you're taking advantage of the separation of compute and storage to essentially standardize where you store your data, you're breaking down your silos, allowing anyone to analyze the data by connecting to this data that's in place. So whether you're using Tableau or you're using Looker or Power BI, they can all connect to your data, whether it's, whether it's in Redshift or in BigQuery or Snowflake. You don't have to move the data around, right? So you build that connectivity, and then after that, you start to basically build in streaming, right? So the idea is as new data comes in, you essentially stream the data, right, into this data warehouse, and as the data is getting streamed, you're basically taking care of the quality considerations. And we, we talk about this idea of, uh, a uh, bronze layer where you're landing the raw data to the next transformed layer where you're cleaning it up to the third, the gold layer, which is this reusable data in a very consistent standardized dictionary. So you basically set up all of those and you allow that to basically then be enriched with things like vision AI and document AI, et cetera, to basically take, care, take into account all of these unstructured data sets and then start to build your machine learning models on top of this enriched data sets. And finally, take those things that you've created and put APIs in front of them and make them data products. So that's essentially the strategic journey that you go from having these siloed systems all the way to basically ending up with data products. 
So, and the good thing is that as you go from being on premises to basically building infrastructure as a service, you're essentially using the same technologies but on the cloud, to basically using separation of computer and storage, you start to get auto scaling, to then finally becoming completely serverless data products that scale on demand, your cost actually starts to go down because you're managing less and less infrastructure, right? But even as your the cost is going down, your capability is going up, right? So this is essentially the end goal. Not everyone ends up at uh, step number seven and because it's a multi-year journey, but at ev every step of the journey, you're basically getting better things. So as you go through this, one of the very important things to keep in mind is that you want to think about your organization itself and you want to build a data platform that is corresponds to the organization that you have, right? Different organizations are different, right? So you have some organizations that are highly analyst driven. So for example, Home Depot has about a hundred times as many analysts as they have engineers. Why? Because they need to stock their store. They have so many SKUs. So basically understanding how each one of those SKUs is selling and figuring out when to reorder it, when to where, like which stores need to carry it, all of that, that's exponentially more people than they have engineers. So that is an example of an analyst driven organization. And a lot of these really large organizations that have many, many, many stores, footprint, et cetera, they're very analyst heavy. And so when you build your data platform, you want to build it what I call SQL first, right? Not not programmer first, but SQL first. So you want to basically build it in such a way that as many things as possible can be done with SQL and these days with natural language if possible, right? On the other side, right, you basically have organizations that are engineering driven, right? So these tend to be highly technology organizations. Spotify is an example of an organization that's highly engineering driven. And the way that you build a data platform for Spotify is very different from the way that you build a data platform for Home Depot. And so in, in an organization, you wanna think about who your primary users are. And if your primary users are analysts, you basically want to essentially think about building it SQL first around data warehouse technologies, where if you have an organization that's engineering first, you're essentially thinking about building it on streaming first. Right, so basically, uh, so you make that, that that kind of a decision, right? Another thing that you often will have to deal with is you will not start at the place that you want to be. You want to be able to migrate things. So how do you do that? Well, I won't get into the details of this, but the basic thing is you want to do this stage by stage. You don't want to bite off too much. So this idea of basically taking your large migration and being able to map it into how much effort will it take to migrate to the business value that you're gonna get by migrating and figuring out each type of migration, where does it fall in the spectrum, allows you to make a decision on how to migrate and what to migrate. And meanwhile, you keep the rest of your stuff in your older systems and you basically let your old and your new work together as you go along. So this idea of basically staging the migration and choosing the most impactful things first while not trying to basically boil the ocean, right? That's an important thing. Now, a very common place that you say, okay, I'm gonna store the data where I'm gonna store it. There's three common solutions, L data lakes, data warehouses, lake houses, right? So quick things and what, what are some of the things that you think about? When you're thinking about using a data lake, you basically have a number of different technologies regardless of which cloud you're working in. You basically have appropriate managed services for it. So for example, if you're working on AWS, you should be thinking about, if I'm doing streaming ingest, I'm going to be using Kinesis. If you're on Google Cloud, you're basically thinking about th using PubSub. You're thinking about basically using uh, you know, a data flow. So that's the basic idea of, figuring out the right technology to basically populate this data lake. And as you're doing it, you want to basically think about what, what we just talked about. Are you analyst driven or are you engineering driven? And depending on that, these technologies 
will either be done by the business or it will be done by the centralized IT department. Then engineering organization, they'll be done by an engineering department. In an analyst organization, this will be done using things like DBT, for example. Right? It will be done with, with SQL. So you basically have choices in how you do your do it, and that's basically you want to map it to the kind of users who are going to be doing it. And right, once you do that, right, you basically then think about how do you basically over time basically make these things more serverless and much more automatically scalable as you go along. Very similar kind of considerations if you decide that you're going to basically land all of your data in a data warehouse. And at that point, the ideal architecture for a data warehouse is what's called a hub and spoke architecture. Right? Hub and spoke is what like a lot of US airlines do, right? So everybody flies into, like American Airlines, their hub is Dallas. So if, you, if I want to fly from uh, Seattle to uh, you know, Chattanooga, right? I'm going to fly to Dallas, and then from Dallas, I'm going to fly to Chattanooga, right? So that's the basic idea here, that data warehouse, BigQuery on the Google Cloud sense, will be the hub and everything, right? Loading, querying, storing, streaming, they're all interacting with this data in BigQuery. And the idea is that whether you have third party systems, whether you have transactional systems, whether you need to publish your data, whether you need to run ML models on it, whether you want to do analytics on it, you work on the data in BigQuery, right? So BigQuery becomes the central hub around which everything happens, which is why you have things like BigQuery ML, if you just want to do machine learning on the data in BigQuery, right? that whole idea of simplifying and streamlining everything in such a way that everything happens in that central data warehouse and provides all of that capability. Right? So for an analyst org, you really want to think about a hub and spoke architecture and choose the best, right, the best technology that you can for this hub. And when you're doing this, right, you always have to make this uh, tension between should I do this in the central team or should I do this in the businesses, all right? Do I centralize or do I federate? And at that point, it usually, right, you basically map all of the things that you're basically going to be doing and you say who's going to be doing it and does this person have SQL skills or programming skills? And based on that, you make the decision. So this is a very common kind of scenario where you're saying, okay, my central team is going to take care of the feature store, the data catalog, and the classification, but my business team that needs to get some data from my finance system, they're going to basically go run their own five trend systems and not the central team because they, they need to have control and the kind number of people who have access to that finance data is going to be really, really, really small. So it's going to be much easier to control and, uh, and clarify if that's done in the business team. Now, we talked about a data lake, we talked about data warehouse. The third option is a lake house, right? And when you're building a lake house, a lake house is essentially this idea that a lot of organizations are not purely analysts, are not purely engineers. Everybody is some uncomfortable mix of the two, right? So at that point, you need to have both SQL support and code support. So how do you do that? Well, you use a lake house. And the good thing is that you know, whether if you build a lake house on Databricks, you build a lake house on BigQuery, you build a lake house on Snowflake, they will all support the other thing. So if you're on Databricks, you can still run SQL. If you're on Snowflake, you can still do Snowpark. Right? If you're on BigQuery, you can still do serverless park. So you have the ability to do the other thing, but of course, the, the core capability is always going to be better than this ancillary capability. So the basic idea is that if you're basically going to be building some building a lake house on storage, right, which is basically you're building it on something like Databricks, all of your transformations are going to happen during Spark, but you're going to allow querying of data. The way that you're going to do that is that you're going to store your data in a format like Apache Iceberg that allows that gives you both this capability to query it but also provides all those horizontals that we talked about, right? All those horizontals that we talked about in terms of velocity and security and availability, et cetera. On the other hand, 
if you want to build your lake house on SQL, if you're going to go and building it, you know, this looks like a Rube Goldberg kind of uh, situation. But really, all we're talking about is that whole idea of you land your raw data and then you transform it to clean it up. And then that becomes your silver layer. And then you transform it once more for your specific business use cases. And that becomes your gold layer. Right? So basically doing that kind of three levels of, uh, of, of cleanup. And then you do all of your transformations using SQL. You train your models, your machine learning models on the data stored in the data warehouse. And if necessary, you can basically do things on native storage. Okay. And the good thing is, regardless of which lake house you have, there's a way to basically take where you are and move it in stages to the other kind, kind of lake house. So, okay. uh, so let me just... So the idea behind a lake house is they have a single system that supports all workloads. But the one workload that lake houses don't support very well is streaming. And over time, you will want to move towards streaming. So you can basically do things as a, a half kind of way with what's called micro batch. Rather than processing data once a day, you start to process the data once an hour, once every five minutes, once every minute, etc. Speed it up. And that becomes close to streaming. But the ideal thing is you process the events as they happen. That's what's called full streaming. And so you basically want to make this distinction between whether you want streaming ETL, processing the data and inserting it in a data warehouse and supporting live querying, or do you even want streaming machine learning to basically make decisions on those events as they happen. And the architecture of those applications is different depending on how you do that. So that's one more decision that you make as you build your data platform. Finally, about like the whole uh, hybrid and edge, your ideal architecture is what's called a single pane of glass. Regardless of where your data resides, even if your data is in AWS and other data is in Azure, you can still query it in the single interface. And that's very common. Like for example, if you have Tableau, you may not think about it, but you're basically connecting to different data sources and you're basically creating a visualization off of them. That's a single pane of glass. Fortunately, like on Google Cloud, for example, BigQuery Omni gives you that single pane of glass. So you have that ability to create single panes of glass. If you can't do that, you can do what's called CDC, change data capture. As changes happen in the original system, you have a streaming pipeline that flushes the data into the destination. This is not as good, but it works, okay? On the edge, again, you need to make a decision about whether do you want smart devices or do you want smart gateways. Smart devices are more expensive, right? But they are much more capable. A smart gateway is a cheaper way of accomplishing things, but it's not going to be as good, right? But again, you want to know when, when you need to splurge for a smart device, when can you get away with a smart gateway? And in reality, of course, because of this cost consideration, you tend to have a mix of the two. Right? So some things, uh, this is an example of a factory environment where you basically have both smart gateways and smart devices depending on wh what you need where. Right? And finally, right, uh, uh, on AI itself, you basically have different types of AI applications, whether you're understanding unstructured data or generating unstructured data with LLMs or predicting outcomes or forecasting values, each of these has a different kind of application architecture and depend and what you know, bottom line is in your building an ML platform, you have to be aware of what types of applications you're going to be building and make sure that your ML platform supports all of those applications. Right? So you need to basically think about if I'm developing, here's what the architecture is going to be. If I'm deploying, here's what the architecture is going to be. And does my ML platform actually support all of these types of applications okay so with that right thank you okay. uh, again uh, these are all excerpts from this book that's a QR code for the book uh, that QR code will take you the link to my slides and if you want to follow me on LinkedIn that's there and I think we have time for like two questions yes Will you share the presentation? yes Here's the link to the slides. Thank you. Yes. So just um, in terms of just measuring 
when a company should sort of switch this sort of really robust mm -hmm. data processing pipelines. Right. And if you, if you, I think it would be great if you give some sort of mental model. Let's say we have like, I don't know, 100 customers per right. day so, actively. So, so, so Victor says like, you know, uh, how would I know when I need to switch from like the most basic kind of thing to the next level up and the next level up. And uh, unfortunately, this comes down to more of a business value discussion, right? Uh, and it comes down to those horizontals that we talked about. In reality, what people often do is that they say, okay, I'm now spending $100,000 to basically maintain the system that only gives me $30,000 in value. I'm not getting an ROI. Right, right. Should I shut it down or not? And then basically the engineering team comes and says, oh, no, no, no. If we basically make these changes, right. we can actually lower the cost. Right. So usually this becomes very, very, very driven by right. that initial, my system is not able to keep up. So I'm going to subsample my data. Right. All right. And you say, okay, I don't want to subsample my data. Right. So what is my, right. what is my way out of it? Right. And that's the reason. No one ever does this beforehand, unfortunately. Everyone does it in a very reactive way. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. okay, I know I went through this very fast, but just wanted to give you an idea of uh, people have now been building data and ML platforms for a while now. We know how to build them. We know what works in different scenarios. And so this was just to say that these decisions that you guys are going to be faced with or your engineering teams are going to be faced with, there are answers out there. It sometimes can be hard to find them if you just go around searching on the internet. So we now have a catalog of it that tells you when to do what. And just wanted to put that out there. But thank you all very much.